Hey everyone, welcome to Round Ball Stew. I am Matt Straup. It is Friday, October 21st, and this is your serviceable and intriguing waiver wire pickups podcast. We will be highlighting some of the key players to consider on the wire heading into and throughout the weekend at the start of week one. I'm jo- joined by Jonas Nader, who writes the waiver wire column on NBC Sports Edge, and Raphael Johnson, who frequently adds players off of waivers in a number of very competitive fantasy leagues. <laughs> Guys, First of all, I mean, Raph, you and I were talking offline. Just it was really nice to be back with real real box scores, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, th- I mean we still don't know like everything in terms of how rotation is gonna break down and whatnot, but it's a lot better to have to break this stuff down as opposed to like a preseason game where a guy may play like ten minutes and then Yeah. <laughs> right. You don't see him again because he's headed off to the G League or something <laughs> like that. But for sure. For sure, Jonas, you you certainly have a twinkle in your eye here as we as we embark on this our first of many waiver podcasts. This yeah, season. I'm excited because like there was a couple of good grabs that you were able to get right away. Like we'll talk about a few of those in a second. But you mentioned some Kawhi Leonard therapy, and I just gotta yeah. say, where did you guys see him get drafted at? Because like I saw people taking him like late second, early third, and I'm just like, why? You know what I mean? Like there was no discount at all for a guy that missed a yeah. whole year. And now suddenly people are like, why did I just spend a second round pick on him? And dude, yesterday I thought he wasn't going to play. Like it was like seven minutes into the second quarter. Like, oh my God, it's quiet. just going to get out this entire game. And then he finally checked in. But man, like good grief. Yeah. Well, let, let's do that. Let's let's do that Kawhi therapy. Because I did mention it to you guys right before we rolled here. In the company league, okay? I had the number one pick, 14 team league. We're all in it. I was worried about that turn 28 and 29 because i had s- several guys i wanted but i was a little worried about getting into an awkward situation where i'm reaching for someone or all all the guys i wanted were gone mostly i got siakam at 28 i was happy with that and i was like jonas you took evan mobley right after me and i yeah. wish i'd done that now but i didn't i could have taken bradley beal i could have taken some other guys but i took i took Kawhi 29th okay i just did it i heard ryan Knauss's voice in my head talking about how this is a top five guy when he plays. None of us imagined a scenario where Kawhi Leonard was checking into the game with six minutes left in the second quarter. So, I mean, just a worst-case scenario, right, on opening night. We already are hearing that he's going to miss one of the back-to-back games this weekend. So I'm not panicked, but I'm already feeling like I want to get out of this business. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I sent out I sent out a few offers this morning, okay, in that league. I. I offered him for Bradley Beal, who took, went eight picks after him. That got declined. I offered him for Nikola Vucevic, who went six picks after him. Still waiting on that one. Ryan, if you're listening, I think you should do it. It's a good idea for you. I also offered him, and, I, and this is the one I want to ask you guys about, because how far would we go trading Kawhi Leonard at this point, right? And I think maybe some fantasy managers are wondering this, which is why we're having this conversation. It's not just for me, even though it sounds like it's just for me. Okay, I just want to be clear about that. I offered him for Terry Rozier in that league who went, I believe, 14, maybe a full round after him mm-hmm. to Noah. What do you think? What, well, who would you rather have right now? Would you rather have Terry Rozier or Kawhi Leonard? I'm going Rozier. What about you, Raph? Same. Mm-hmm. I know he's going to play pretty much every night <laughs> as long as he's healthy. Yep. And then right. you also have the LaMelo ball situation. I think if you have Kawhi, you may have to hold on to him and wait until he gets up to like 30, 33 minutes per game and he's right. back starting because then you can actually get, I would say, fair value for him. Because at this point, right. if you're trying to move him on the strength of one game, one game, excuse me, you're probably going to get robbed when we look at it if he's healthy later in the season. So I would say stick it out personally. So you're saying take down my Vucevic and Rozier offers. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Take him yeah. down, but even though we'd rather have Rozier right now, Kawhi. You would rather point. have him, but so would the person you're offering these trades yeah. to. Matt, put it this way: if you were, let's say, you were a sports book and you were predicting how many games Kawhi would play, what would the over under be? 51, 55, 60? It'd be... Sixty is sixty. I'm kind of imagining sixty, maybe. Okay, because there's gonna be like what 13, 14 back to backs, automatic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Being peace, and there's gonna be some other games where like. They're late in March and they're playing the Thunder. Like we're gonna sick Kawhi. You know what I mean? Like it's gonna be those right. games as well. So you're looking at 20 missed games right off the bat. I wouldn't put him in my top 50 right now. Yeah. Just being honest. But but then I should take Terry Rozier for him. I have Terry Rozier in my top 50 though. But you should take. Him. I know. Yes. 
You yeah. should take it. You, I'm getting mixed you signals take from him, you guys. The I, other per, no, you should take them, but the other person shouldn't give them to yeah, you. Yeah, that's, that's what, what we're saying. saying. Right. But so I'm going to leave the offer up. I'm going to give him a chance to respond. <laughs> All yeah, right. Of course. It's not yeah, insulting. You... It's not insulting. <laughs> I can see the panic in your eyes, Matt. You're panicking. <laughs> I, I'm pretty <laughs> happy with most of my drafts, too. but that one pick, yeah. I knew it right away when I did it. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. It was kind of like when you took Ben Simmons in that league, no, uh, Jonas, and you said, look away. Look yeah, away, everyone. Look away. <laughs> That's how I felt about my Kawhi pick. Yeah. Please look away. Okay. I don't feel much better. You guys made me feel actually somehow worse, but I appreciate the effort. Um. All right. All right. Waiver wire pickups. Most of these players uh, throughout the season are going to be rostered in 40% of Yahoo leagues or less, right? But we do have a couple exceptions to start the season, and one of those is Jalen Duran, 46% rostered as of this conversation. Now, before we get into the numbers, youngest player in the NBA, right? Born in November 2003. A few weeks after LeBron James made his NBA de debut, which is just mind-blowing to me. I looked it up. Jalen Duran's birthday was the night that LeBron, day that LeBron James played his 11th NBA game. It's just crazy stuff. Jeez. Anyways, so guys, I want to hear both of your opinions. But first things first, Jonas, I mean, this strikes me as the clear-cut kind of no-brainer pickup home run swing for people in their home leagues uh, if he didn't get drafted, right? Yeah, so every week I write out all the players that I'm looking to add, and then I have to rank them. But there was no question about Jalen. I just went ahead and put him at number one because dude's insane, right? Um, and the thing about Jalen that makes him interesting, you could have got him in the last round or even off the waiver wire just now because the Pistons all along have said, and this is from multiple beat reporters, he's going to start out in the G League. He's barely going to yep. play. He's raw. He's not ready. I'm like, what? He looked so good <laughs> in the preseason. And then yeah. the kind of thing that opened things up for him is that Isaiah Livers and uh, Marvin Bagley both went down in like the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. That opened up the, the playing time for him. Got 25 minutes in the opener, double-doubled. I think it was like three or four, four blocks. Went 0-4 from the free throw line. We'll worry about that later. If you have to punt free throws, whatever. The dude's a beast. I don't think he's given those minutes back. Like, G League's done. Like, I, I don't think he's given those minutes back. I think he's here to stay. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I saw some of those same preseason reports, and mm -hmm. now I'm wondering why. Yes. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think something else to watch down the line, they've encouraged Isaiah Stewart to take more three-pointers. I think he was just one for four in the opener. If he becomes a respectable perimeter shooter, maybe we see times when those two are on the floor together, you know, because mm -hmm. you've got Sadiq Bey, you've got Bojan Bogdanovic, but that's a team that, I think there's still a need for spacing. Like everyone in the NBA is looking constantly looking for spacing, but that's something that could potentially help out during fantasy wise down the line. And yeah, 46% rostered right now. If he's hanging on a waiver wire in your league, it, it's time to go get him and not look back. So 14 points, 11 rebounds, three blocks. He was over four from the free throw line. That's the only negative thing we can say, but mm -hmm. I think in college he was like a 62% free throw shooter. Or so, yeah. um, Hopefully something like that, low volume in the 60s. We can live with that. And the one other thing I'll say about Duran is youngest player in the NBA, as we said, but physically this guy is ready for the NBA. Yeah. You think youngest guy in the you youngest player in the NBA, you think, oh, maybe physically he's not ready. No, no. If if you've seen him play or seen the highlights, this is uh, that guy's ready, ready mm -hmm. to play down low in the NBA right now. So uh impressive stuff. Yeah. Do you know how painful it is being 20 minutes from the arena and knowing that the Hornets passed on this guy and now we're starting yeah. mason Plumley, and then nick richards behind him who, I mean, it's just who we'll talk there. about who we will talk about and the knicks raf the knicks mm -hmm. you the want to remind everyone yeah. this the, the deal with the knicks and jalen duran yeah um <laughs> no, <you didn't laughs> <call me. laughs> not really but i can i can understand it more so from the knicks standpoint because you know obviously re-signing mitchell robinson didn't play well in the opener but i think there was enough equity built up there where they're kind of happy with what he's given them, what he could potentially give them. And Isaiah Hartenstein was a good signing mm -hmm. in the summer. So at least they have an excuse. Charlotte right. does not. Yeah. Right. It's like Jalen Duran is kind of like already what we hoped Mitchell Robinson would be. It seems like yeah. maybe or what, what Mitchell Robinson aspires to become Jalen Duran. I don't know. Anyways, don't want to overhype him. It, it, there could there's could certainly be turbulence at this point, right? Yeah. It's one good game, but it was it was pretty electric. Uh, another rookie big man, Jonas, and I don't know what order you plan to go in, but uh, we'll go with Walker Kessler next. Thirty one percent rostered in Yahoo. 
Yep, I have him number two right now on waiver wire too. Um, obviously, the opener was a little misleading because Kelly Lennox only played 50 minutes for foul trouble. Jared right. Vanderbilt fouled out early, but I'm just yeah. gonna a quick sidebar here. Vanderbilt was awesome. He out rebounded Denver in the first half. He was just a beast, <laughs> dude. I'm excited yeah. about him. But Kessler, I love him. Um, the Kelly Olenek experiment is going to end at some point this season. We don't know when. But until then, if Kessler can hang around 15, 18 minutes in the meantime and then have those random game forgets up to 24 and 25, he's going to have value, right? We've seen Drummond yeah. in the past have value in 15, 18 minutes because of blocks, boards, field percentage. I think Kessler is going to be in that same territory. He averaged, what, five blocks at Auburn? The dude's yeah, four insane. blocks, so, yeah. Yep, if yeah. you give me two blocks a game, High field goal percentage, didn't miss a shot in the opener. I'm taking him at the end of my bench all day. Yeah, I think he's in a good spot as well. Um, mm -hmm. You also, Udoka Azabuike has been out because of an ankle injury. He's had a couple major ankle injuries in his career. And also, this front office didn't draft Azabuike. So they're not, I don't think mm -hmm. they're as, in, you know, as entrenched in terms of holding on to him as right. maybe a, a holdover front office would be. So, you put that in, I don't think we're going to see that Houston Rockets, Kelly Olenek. And even if we did, they'd probably uh -huh. pull the plug on that because I don't know if that's in the franchise's best interest when you're going to have a hard time signing marquee free agents. Kind of need to build through the draft. So, yeah, Olenek, if he goes off, it, I'd expect some rest days down the line. So, yeah, Walker Kessler is another guy that I would get him now. You don't really expect – high level production at this point but after the all-star break maybe he kind of takes off do you think i can get walker kessler for Kawhi leonard maybe i can just <laughs> cut my loss yeah. <laughs> try it <laughs> um i will say i will say kelly olenic is a guy that i'm as as much as i i like walker kessler better but i'm get, i mean kelly Olynyk's 26 percent rostered i mean i think yeah. if you don't get walker kessler i think taking a flyer on olenic nothing wrong with that even though his first game was a bust due to foul trouble and Kessler, 12 points, 10 boards, one steal in 24 minutes. You love to see the minutes right away. Uh, in a game, by the way, the Jazz won. I, Jonas, I thought I thought we were tanking here. What's going on? Oh, don't worry. It's coming. It's, okay. it's absolutely coming, dude. Like, there's okay. no doubt about it. Like, I think they're realizing it. And just to Ralph's point, too, if they see Atlantic start going off for 20 points and five assists a game, they're going to be like, all right, let's slow it down, Chief. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, they kind of smoked the Nuggets in they that did. game. It was emotional. Everyone was fired up. It, it was like playoff atmosphere. It was oh, wild. Remember. Every time I looked over at that game, remember Colin that. Sexton's all fired up. It was like, is this team tanking? What's yeah. going on here? Don't forget, the Nuggets uh, got rid of Vanderbilt. He took that personal last night. Yeah. He was all over them. Love it. All right. Uh, next name. And, and, again, we may be a little bit out of order here. Hopefully, we'll make clear who we like the most as we go down this list. But Tyus Jones is 28% rostered in Yahoo Leagues. And I think many, myself included, said or find themselves saying, I don't really want the Grizzlies' backup point guard. I'm not excited to add a backup point guard. But he was productive in 25 minutes in their first game, Jonas. Do you think this is sustainable in any way? It's not sustainable. Um, I don't think he's a long-term pickup by any means. But I think he can have a weak value of streaming territory because – Dylan Brooks is already missing tonight. He's doubtful. And if he's doubtful, mm -hmm. usually there's a chance he'll miss the next game as well. Um, and Tyus Jones, if he's getting minutes alongside John Morant, that puts him in the 25 to 28 minute range. This is a guy, high level assist guy, high level steals guy, super efficient, low turnovers, not many threes, but that's okay. Um, he's going to be a top 100 player in 25, 28 minutes, but don't drop someone you will miss because like I said, this run is going to come to an end. Yeah, you know, between Brooks and Jaron Jackson Jr., they're going to need someone else to take some shots. So I think for mm -hmm. the time being, Jones is going to have to be a bit more aggressive in terms of looking for his own offense. I think he was five for 15 Wednesday night. So mm -hmm. if he can get you 10 to 12 shots per game, you're really going to like that. Like Jonas mentioned, he's a low turnover guy too. So that's all the more reason to kind of grab him in the short term. And I think when Brooks comes back is when you may want to consider looking for someone else who may have a bit more consistent high usage so to speak so 15 points four rebounds three assists a steal and three triples for tyus jones as we move to oklahoma city and jalen williams 26 percent rostered rough first game for the preseason sensation uh five points in six minutes uh an apparent eye injury had him leaving mm -hmm. early uh jonas then raf do we like his outlook enough to hold on to him or to add him where he's available 
Yeah, I mean, it sounds like he has a good chance of playing tomorrow. I believe they play tomorrow with a mask on, from what I've heard. Um, like I said, one of the best players in preseason. And the reason I like Jalen Williams is, is he's kind of a hedge against all the OKC studs, right? So let's say the Thunder are going to be shady with SGA or Josh Giddy at some point. Well, there's Jalen Williams, right? You take either one of those guys out of the equation, and we're, we could be talking about a top 75, maybe top 50 guy. This is a guy who honestly looks like Tyreek Evans did as a rookie. You know what I mean? Just a bigger guard, can yeah. play, make, mm-hmm. can rebound, can run on the break, can do a little bit of everything. So there's a lot to like about Jalen Williams. And like I said, if you have Giddy or SGA, I would go out of my way to make sure Jalen Williams is on my team. Yeah. Um, I think at Santa Clara, they let him do practically everything, you know, in terms of making plays, scoring for himself as well. So I think it's really going to help him in Oklahoma City. We saw flashes of that during the preseason. They've got a back-to-back this weekend, Saturday, Sunday. So maybe there's a little bit of concern there. But, yeah, if you already have him, by all means, hold on to him. All right. Next up is a guy by the name of Cam Reddish. Uh, 23% rostered. He had a big opener with no Quentin Grimes. Jonas, I typically throw to you first because you write the waiver wide column. But Raph is, <laughs> Raph is our Knicks expert here. So, yeah. Raph, let's start with your thoughts. Uh how are we approaching Reddish? I mean, is there a chance for him to carve out a real consistent role here? Because this is a guy who not long ago wanted out of New York, and it seemed like they weren't going to play him. And then opening day arrives, and it's like, whoa, Reddish is going off. Well, yeah, because Quentin Grimes is hurt. So that, that's yeah. the big thing here. So for that reason, I would approach with some caution because mm-hmm. as good as he looked Wednesday night, you have the opportunity with Grimes down, but also – He hasn't been the most consistent player at any point in his brief NBA career to date, as you can probably attest to down in Atlanta. uh... None of that tracks for me. (laughs) I don't remember any of that. So I think (laughs) if you're you're in dire need, especially in like a deeper league for like some wing production, maybe you can roll the dice on him in the short term. But I would not expect like this sudden emergence as the Knicks first wing off the bench, you know, Mm -hmm. down the line where you get to like February or March. Yeah, as Ralph said, I mean, Cam wasn't supposed to be in the rotation on opening night. Grimes' injury obviously changes things. Um, I remember, though, last year, Matt, how many times did we do the waiver wire pod and, like, it was Cam Reddish was on there, like, every other week. And it's just, (laughs) like, he'll have two games where he looks like Paul George and then two games where he looks like he doesn't belong in a pickup game at my local YMCA. You know what I mean? Like, he just disappears. Uh, So, yes, like Ralph said, if you're in a deeper league, you need a wing that can do a little bit of everything. Sure, pick him up. But as soon as Grimes gets back, there's just no chance that Cam's ahead of him. No chance, right? They've really talked up Grimes. Yeah. The star in the preseason. Or sorry, over the summer, I should say. But yeah, I just don't see how Cam sticks unless he's traded. 22 points, five rebounds, three steals, one block, three three-pointers in 28 minutes. So some, I guess, short-term streaming appeal. But again, it's another situation where prioritize the guys who we think are going to have longer-term value. And speaking of wings producing off the bench, I want to talk Trey Murphy. And I know you do, you guys do as well. 21% rostered, had an interesting opener, but I have some questions about it. I want to hear you guys' thoughts first. Yeah. So he's going to be actually number three on my list behind Jalen Duran and Walker Kessler. Uh, there's a lot to like. If you look at that roster, the one thing that stands out is this team needs spacing, right? Uh, to mm-hmm. allow Zion to be the best he can possibly, they need spacing. Uh, and Trey Murphy is the only one that can do that on their team. Uh, amazing debut. Uh, had four three-pointers, 16 points, nine rebounds, two assists, and a block. He looked good mm. over the summer. He led the Pelicans in fancy value during the preseason. Willie Green talked him up after the game, said he was fantastic. Told him, don't hesitate, just shoot. So I'm all in on Trey Murphy. I think it's going to be a great add, even in 25, 28 minutes per game. Yeah, for sure. The spacing, as you mentioned, They only had three guys hit multiple three-pointers in that game Wednesday night. Um, Obviously, C.J. McCollum and and Brandon Ingram, you're going to expect that from them. Then you have Trey Murphy hitting four. So the spacing concerns, no one on the bench. I think they had one three-pointer from their reserves outside of Trey Murphy. So that second unit's really going to need his shooting. And it's an opportunity for him to be more aggressive offensively. So, yeah, Trey Murphy – he had his ups and downs last season, but right now I think it's a good opportunity to get in there on the if he if he's still sitting on your leaves waiver wire. So 16 points, nine boards, two dimes, one block, four triples in 24 minutes. I think the only question I have is by my count, six points and three rebounds came in, you know, utter garbage time in the fourth. Mm-hmm. 
but I don't know. I, I don't want to nitpick too much. It's clear they like the player. I think that would just be my only, you know, caution there of a game in a game that got really lopsided. By the way, <clears throat> uh, did Brandon Ingram grow like five inches and gain like eighty pounds? He looks enormous. It, did anyone <laughs> else have that experience watching that game? Brandon Ingram, who used to be like the most spindly, wiry guy in the league, just looks huge now. Am, am I wrong? Does it, I think his hairstyle contributes. Yeah, because he, he, he usually has him. cornrows, and yeah. now okay. he, he's got the blowout. So mm-hmm. I, I haven't have looked into bit. like what his you know muscle watch reports are from over the summer. I just <laughs> feel like Ingram, Ingram got a lot like bulkier. He just yeah. looks. I think just we're just worried cool. that he would be healthy. Period. Not so much yeah. muscle watch. So maybe right. we kind of ignored that. Right. All right. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna deep dive that after the podcast. I'm not gonna <laughs> do it live on the air here. But that's that's the rest of my afternoon. Hard hitting journalism. Um, I love it. <laughs> uh, Jonas. Uh, where where do you want to take it next? Let the the road yeah. opens yeah. up from here. We could go any number of directions. Where should we go next? You know what. I want to go to Grant Williams soon, but I want to go to Daniel Gafford first. Now, he didn't well, play a ton yeah. of minutes, but Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, 12 points, 7 rebounds, 1 steal, 1 block, and 16 minutes. He mm-hmm. was amazing. High energy yep. like we used to see. Absolutely yep. loved it. The funny thing about it was that Chris Porzingis, now this is in quotes, turned his left ankle as he and teammates were jumping around immediately after pregame introductions. <laughs> Who else in the NBA would get hurt in the pregame warm-ups? Miles Turner. Miles Turner, yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, but, man, yes, I love taken. Gafford. I think he's going to have standalone value as a reserve. And if Przingis misses 10, 15, 20, 25 games, man, Gafford is just going to eat. He looks good this year. You said if Przingis misses yeah. <laughs> any game? When? Yeah, that's that's unfortunate that we have to go that go that far. But that's pretty much a reason why Gafford should be out there. And you get into the later rounds – these leagues, there's not too much to, to pick from in terms of centers. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I like that Gafford pick as well. So, uh, I, what, 12.7 rebounds, a steal, and a block in 16 minutes is known at, officially as a Daniel Gafford. I mean, that you cannot have a more quintessential stat line experience that sums up a guy. And somehow, if he got more minutes, he would like end up in foul trouble and have worse numbers, I think. So it's like 16 minutes is almost a sweet spot for Daniel Gafford to do a ton of damage. But I, I do want to ask, because there's three guys kind of in this low 20s rostered range who I want to kind of have you guys pick between. You mentioned Grant Williams, Jonas, so we'll talk yeah. him too. He's 23% rostered. Gafford is 22% rostered. Royce O'Neal, who really had an eye-catching stat line in the opener, is 21% rostered. How do we How do we prioritize those three if they're all sitting on people's wires? You know, I'm going to go Gafford for pure, up, for pure upside, followed by Royce. I think the minutes are going to be there, even with Joe Harris and Seth Curry back. Um, and then Grant Williams, who still has a couple of holes in his fantasy game. But what about, what about you, Roth? What do you think? I think I would go Grant Williams ahead of Royce O'Neal, just okay. because of that front court rotation in Boston. No Robert Williams, probably until 2023. Um, I know Al Horford said during the preseason that he planned on playing in both ends of back-to-backs. I I need to see that before I believe it. And then at that point, Noah Vonley, I mean, with all due respect, there's a reason why he was out of the NBA for a while, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. He did. He played well enough during the preseason to earn himself a contract in that backup center job. But I just think Grant Williams has a little bit better setup in terms of sustained fantasy success than Royce O'Neal does. Yeah, Royce O'Neal had, like I said, that eye-catching opening stat line, 10.7 rebounds, three dimes, three steals, two blocks, two threes. That's a more of a dynamic stat line than we're accustomed to from Royce O'Neal, a guy who really has kind of famously gotten a lot of minutes and belonged on the NBA floor because of his intangibles, but doesn't always translate to numbers. So mm-hmm. I'm a little concerned about you know, taking too much away from that stat line. I'd need to see it a few more times, Jonas, before I got excited. Yeah, he's kind of like a P.J. Tucker slash Bruce Brown type where he can get you a ton of minutes. Some games he'll have eight points and nothing else. Another game will have a a gym like this where he's getting multiple steals Mm -hmm. and blocks. And if you looked at him last year, he was actually in the late round territory because, yes, he didn't have many eye-popping games, but it was just slow, consistent production all the way through. Uh, very right. durable, and he's the only defender on that Nets roster right now, too. So I think that keeps him heavily involved um, with Joe Harris yeah. and Seth Curry coming back because they tried Ben Simmons, 
uh, in the front court for a little bit on defense and it did not go well. So uh, I still think Royce has a big role. Uh, let's talk about a couple of Miami Heat players. Max Struess had a big opener. He's 19% rostered. And Caleb Martin had, a, had, you know, did some things, but had a relatively quiet opener. He's 8% rostered. So how should we how should we sort out these guys, Jonas? You see, the thing is, is that, yes, Struess had the bigger game, but I actually like Martin a little bit more. Like, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm happy with the minutes that Martin got, and he has better permanent upside in everything except for points and threes, which are easily replaceable elsewhere in your rosters, right? So when you're looking at the waiver wire, you're not really prioritizing what Struess does. So I think mm -hmm. he's more of a high-end streamer, a guy that's over four uh, three-pointers per 36 minutes for his career. Uh, so for that reason, I like Caleb Martin. He's starting, he's getting big minutes, good steal and block rates, decent three-point shooter, can play make a little bit. And Victor Aladipo... I hate to say it, but he's cooked. I mean, they said his other leg that's not hurt is compensating, and that's why he got hurt. I'm very worried about Aladipo. I feel terrible for him. Great guy. It just it just may not happen for him. That injury was just com completely career derailing. Yeah, I think the Oladipo situation is why I would lean towards Struce, um, because that second unit is going to need that scoring. Um, in terms of Martin, I do like the value there. My one concern is if Miami makes a deal uh, to bring in mm -hmm. someone who's more inclined to play that power forward role. Right. Um, like we got Jay Crowder just sitting out there in Phoenix playing golf or doing whatever he's doing yeah. to keep himself <laughs> occupied. And he has right. prior history with that franchise and you know, going to the finals in the bubble. So right. maybe they kick the tires on that. I'm not really sure what Miami's going to do, but. I don't know if they can count on Caleb Martin to be that starting power forward for them throughout the season. So I guess right now you can take him, but I like Struess in terms of the long-term potential a bit more. That's a good point. Yeah, the, the Crowder to Heat thing makes almost makes too much sense at this point. Yeah. But mm -hmm. as for Struess, it was 22 points, 7 rebounds, 5 threes in 31 minutes in the opener. Caleb Martin, again, 8% rostered, an actual true – fantasy sleeper this year we say sleeper a lot but this guy actually was a guy you could really get at the end of your drafts seven points four rebounds three dimes two steals and a triple in 29 minutes uh one more name before we hit a break take a quick break is malik beasley we talked a bit about the jazz before a veteran on this team veteran scorer on this team so what's his outlook yeah, we've seen this story before. You get a veteran that ends up on a team that's completely rebuilding. And so we know the playbook here. They're going to let Malik Beasley go out there for 25 to 30 minutes, take 20 shots. doesn't matter how efficient he is. They just want to showcase that he's healthy and that he can fire away, right, and space the floor for a mm -hmm. contender. They cannot wait to get a draft asset for him. It's just a matter of if it's going to be a, a protected first or maybe a couple of seconds. So they cannot wait to trade Malik Beasley. But until then, they're going to ride him. Raph, I'll turn it to you. What do you think? Yeah, he's one guy that even if he's coming off the bench as he did in the opener, I think you still want to have him on your roster just because of the points and three-pointers potential. Um, and, yeah, not a bad idea to let him just fire away, kind of put himself in the in the shop window, so to speak, because come <laughs> February, maybe he can help out a team that, that needs some spacing. Uh, we watched one last night, but I don't think that said Lakers roster is going to be in the, the playoff conversation at that point personally. So. You know, Malik's a guy who can definitely help out a contender with his shooting ability down the line. And he can help out your fantasy roster right now, too. I can't believe you guys don't believe this Jazz team is a contender. I am I am all in. I am, <laughs> I've seen enough. I've seen enough. I am I am buying in. Uh Malik Beasley, 15 points, five rebounds, three triples in 25 minutes in game one with the Jazz. We have more names to hit on the waiver wire. First, we're gonna take a quick break. The basketball season is here, and you can get a jump start on your draft and your team evaluation if you already drafted with the Roto World Fantasy Draft Guide. Get player profiles, expert rankings, mock drafts, and more. Use code use code Hoops Five at checkout and get yours for just five dollars. Go to NBCSportsEdge.com/EdgePlus today. Also, download the Roto World app to receive breaking player news all season long. Stay ahead of the competition by favoriting players on your roster. Get the latest injury updates, player news, and much more delivered right to your phone. It's available in your app store today. All right, let's let's uh, let's transition into slightly quicker hits mode here. We don't have to rush through these, but the slight express version. A uh, bunch of guys rostered in 20% of leagues or less. Uh, Jonas, do you have a priority out of this section of the podcast? Yeah, I'm going to go Nick Richards. Now, 
Okay. It was weird because in the off season, we heard Steve Clifford like rave about a center. We all thought it was going to be Mark Williams. And he's just like, dude, right. Nick Richards has been a standout at training camp. He's going to play a ton this year. And to his credit, looked really good last night or the night before. Um, I lost track of how many offensive rebounds he had, but it was a lot. <laughs> um, completely mm-hmm. destroyed the Spurs on the glass. Had a double-double. I think it was like 23, 24 minutes. Um, I don't think he had any blocks, but still, if the minutes are there, right. there's only Mason Plumley ahead of him. He's probably going to be in a timeshare. And like Steve Clifford always does, he's going to slow roll it with Mark Williams. It may be a while before he's even a consistent part of the rotation. So I think you have to add Nick Richards right now, even if you're not excited about it. I mean, the boards are there. The field goal percentage is there. What do you think, Ralph? Yeah. Um, Mason Plumley. we pretty much know what he is as a basketball player and a fantasy asset at this point. No. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I got to go with Nick as well. Um, in, in performances like the one he had the other night, no defensive stats, but as active as he was on the glass, uh, runs the floor well. I think he can be in line for a minute's increase because even once they get LaMelo ball back, I don't even think they're a playing team personally. So that could open things up for Nick Richards down the line um, and give them the opportunity, not just slow play with Mark, but also see what they could potentially have with Nick moving forward. So 19 points, 10 rebounds and nothing else for Nick Richards. I'm, I'm not against picking him up. He's 15% roster, but I do think you guys – given the situation, are maybe writing off Plumley a little too soon. He had 12 points, seven boards, four assists, and a block in 22 minutes. Okay? we He's he's a decent fantasy guy when he's on the floor. You think he's not going to play for this team? You're coping, Matt. You're coping. Plumley's done. Squeaky Dimes is done. His time is over. The Hornets got lucky yeah. against a very bad Spurs team. I think the Plumley experiment is going to come to an end by January. They're going to roll with – it, Richards and then Mark Williams at some point is going to get his run. Like this roster is bad. Um, and the Hornets need to be in the Victor win, win Banyama sweepstakes. They have to, right? The Miles Bridges situation only made it worse. They have to get a high pick in this draft, right? So anything else would be a complete disaster. They're, this team is going nowhere. Um, is it okay if we transition to another center that I like more in this range, though? No, we got to talk about Mason Plumley for 15 more minutes. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, I, the last thing I will say, I really do think in a deeper league, you can you can do worse as like a low-end guy. I'm not saying I have high hopes. I need. Yeah. I also need to confirm if he's still shooting his free throws left-handed because he was two for two in the opener. I didn't see the free throws. Did, does anyone know? Do we have either. confirmation? I didn't see. Yeah, I'm assuming I didn't they see were left-handed. One of the most important storylines of the season to follow, obviously, is yep. Mason Plumley's <laughs> left-handed free throw shooting. Anyways, I'm just saying, late round, deep league, you know, if you're missing out on the other centers, I think he can get you some uh, a few stats here and there. So you guys don't agree. That's okay. That's why we do this. Yes, let's go to the other center you want to talk about. Bruno Fernando, a surprise addition to training camp. Now, I kind of wrote him off, but then surprise like... surprise addition to this episode, we should say. It's like two, three weeks ago, I was reading The Athletic, Kelly Eco, The Athletic, good reporter there. He was like, Bruno Fernando has been sitting out in training camp, and no one really talked about it. And now I'm kind of seeing what they're seeing, right? Because he showed nothing in Atlanta. You remember him. He was a total zero there. The dude has improved a ton. Uh, Had seven points, nine rebounds, seven assists. He had a dime in transition the other day. I was like, what? Where did that come from? Those those are some squeaky (laughs) dimes right there. Yeah. And two blocks on perfect shooting. So they really like Fernando. He looks like he's in better shape. He's pretty mobile now. They cited as rim protection, defensive mobility, and they've talked about Sangoon just being the guy for the second unit. Silas has talked about manufacturing touches for Sangoon just to keep him involved literally every time he's on the floor. And they can't do that in the first unit when you have Jalen Green and Kevin Porter Jr. So, yes, it kind of makes some sense why they're doing it. I don't necessarily agree with it. But in the meantime, let's go with Bruno Fernando off the waiver wire. He's only 18% roster that jumped up a few percentage points from yesterday. Man, let's take a flyer on him. He looked good. Yeah, I think the immediate impulse when a lot of us heard that Fernando could potentially start, it's like, all right, what's wrong with Shangun? Mm-hmm. But right. I think, obviously, given how Fernando played the other night, it's the combination of what's right with him, and also what Jonas mentioned, getting Shangun more touches with the ball, you know, running the show, not as a point guard, but also as a playmaker in the post, can help him out as well. So I wouldn't expect seven rebounds, seven assists per night from Bruno Fernando, obviously. But if he can threaten 10 rebounds and get you a good field goal percentage, get you some defensive stats as well, 
that I would take him over Mason Plumley if you're looking for like a, a deep league kind of center <laughs> yeah. need some help there. If you're looking for some squeaky dimes, basically. I, what I heard you say there, Raph, is seven assists, take it to the bank, Bruno Fernando, all season long. <laughs> yeah. Will average <laughs> seven assists exactly per game. What I said. By the way, I mean, you know this, Raph, from you know all your experience covering college basketball. I mean, this guy's a really good college player and a, a guy yeah. that, you know, I think, I can't remember, the Hawks took him, I think, like early second round. I mean, he was almost a first round caliber player. I know they were excited about him, but it just did not pan out at all in Atlanta. So he was it's not, not like this, yeah. he was no. not this kind of passer at Maryland. So no, but I mean athletically, like he was a, yeah. a pretty intriguing prospect. Um, so it's not like out of nowhere that this guy is potentially figuring it out. But again, we'll have to see. I mean, it might be a situation where after their next game, we're all moving on. But all of these are situations where you're you're kind of evaluating game to game this early in the season. All right. Who's next, Jonas? I want to go to Joshua Primo. Yes. I like it. It wasn't the best opener, but he had 26 minutes. I believe there's mm-hmm. a couple minutes of overlap with Trey Jones as well. And if you look at the Spurs roster, they're going to play multiple guards and wings. They've moved Kelda Jotham to the three. That helps a lot as well. So I think Primo, if he stays in that 25-minute range, he's going to have some games where he just pops off, right? Like, he's exciting. He's a high-usage player. Every time he's on the floor, he thinks he's the man. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um I think he's going to be a a very rocky player to own for the next month or two. But if we're talking late season heroics, I think Primo is going to be one of those guys that literally swings matches by himself because he's that type of player. He's, he's got a lot of upside. Yeah. He's a bit more willing to take chances offensively than Trey Jones is. And I think, you know, if you're looking for that fantasy upside, that's what you want to see. You know, Trey doesn't turn the, the ball over like his older brother, obviously, but you kind of know what you're going to get. He's like that dependable sandwich when you kind of want something a bit more. Right, and I think right. Primo is the guy who can kind of offer that to you fantasy wise. Yeah. What is, what, like, just kind of a turkey, just kind of the regular turkey. Yeah. Kind of what we're <laughs> yeah. Thinking. It's kind of my turkey go-to. Sandwich, not, you know, not, as, yeah. not as adventurous as it could be, you yeah. know? I yeah. Love it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Primo, 10 points, three rebounds, five assists with a block in 26 minutes. Uh, what about his teammate, Jeremy Sochan? Is six uh, percent rostered. Did not pop off the stat sheet in the opener, but did play twenty seven minutes. Yeah, and plus he's getting compared to Dennis Rodman too, so you instantly have to love him just for that. He's a lot of fun. Uh, the key with him is it's going to be defensive upside, right? He's not going to yeah. score right. a ton of points, but at at Baylor, was so good defensively. Um, if he can get what a steal and a block per game, that puts mm-hmm. him top one fifty, right? And he's someone you can just put at the end of your roster, rotate him in every now and then if you need steals or blocks. But I think he's going to be a second half uh, standout, to be honest, because if Popovich is already playing rookies, then you know why, right? It's a <laughs> so I'm excited about him this year. It's just going to be a bumpy ride in the beginning like it is with most rookies. Yeah, you're not going to expect much from him offensively. You know, there's one season at Baylor was a, a difficult ride offensively, but they had enough talent around them to kind of make up for that. Um, second half of the season in San Antonio, they'll probably be able to give him a little more freedom just because, like you mentioned, they aren't going to be a team that we're talking about as a play-in you know, team come February. So that'll be all the more reason. If you want to get in early, just kind of stash him on your bench. If you need some steals and blocks right now, they can do that. But I think yeah. that's about his stealing right now. If you were to pick a player that has like an Herb Jones impact like we saw last year, like this could be one of the candidates for it. Yeah. 4.7 rebounds, two assists with two steals in those 27 minutes. Uh, just a handful of names left here, I think, for us to cover. Uh, where, where, do you have any priority names left, Jonas, on your list? Yes, uh, Shaden Sharp. Now, if you have Damian Lillard on your team, I would go out of my way to have Sharp as like kind of like my end-of-bench guy, right? Looked really, really good in 16 minutes. And if you look at that mm-hmm. roster, that second unit is not good. Yes, Justice mm-hmm. Winslow played well, but is that sustainable? His career tells me otherwise. So there's a lot of minutes up for grabs in Portland, and they need a player that can score on all three levels off the bench. And Sharp is that guy. It's just a matter of time before the minutes really pick up. Yeah, Sharp was hard to trust just because of the lack of activity. You know, he got to Kentucky in January. We heard great things about him in practice, but that's practice. You know, we never got to see him in a game. Then he gets hurt minutes into his summer league debut. So it's like, what do we make of this guy? Mm Mm-hmm. And he looked really good Wednesday night. He's got considerable upside. 
like you mentioned, there aren't too many dependable guys on that second unit. So season progresses, they're looking to contend for a playoff spot and seeding. Maybe he gets to do a bit more if he can build on his performance Wednesday night. 7% rostered. What about Terrence Davis, who had a productive opener, 14 points, five boards, two steals, two triples, just 2% rostered. Anything sustainable there, or do we think he's going to be a little more up and down, hit or miss game to game? Well, people are forgetting he was really good last year before he got hurt. He had several good mm-hmm. games. And uh, at the beginning of his career, too, he was amazing in Toronto. Obviously, he had those off court. I don't even remember what happened there, but he had some off court concerns that kind of threw his career in jeopardy for a little bit. But just pure basketball, he's playing really well. Uh, they didn't have Keegan Murray in the season over, which obviously contributed because they played a lot of multi-guard lineups. But Casey Akpala was a total zero. Like, if I was a coach, I would just say, let's start Keegan Murray and let's give Terrence Davis more minutes in smaller lineups because that's mm-hmm. how the Kings are going to be at their best, right? Uh, Rashawn Holmes yeah. played straight five, no minutes next to Sabonis. That's also good news for the Kings guards. So I like Terrence Davis in deeper leagues. I don't think the minutes will be high enough just yet for standard leagues, but yeah, in a deep league, widely available i'd give him a look next game for sure yeah akpala is a good defender but other than that there's really nothing to see there we've we've been down this road before with him so Mm -hmm. it helps that your head coach is also the coach of your national team that's probably why he's getting this opportunity but yeah that that's he played 16 minutes the other night that should probably drop to about 12 once they get keegan murray back and in the flow of things by the way, Isn't there another player from this national team? It's, it's Nigerian national team, right? Isn't it? Uh, how yes. do you say the last name? Monique or something? Which one? Uh, oh, Chima Moneke? Yeah. It, wasn't he on the yeah. national, national team as well? Yep. Yes. That's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. By the way, speaking of Kings guards, which we were talking about a second ago, uh, we've we've had such a strong finish from De'Aaron Fox the last two years. 33.7 rebounds, seven assists in the opener. Finally going to get a fast start from De'Aaron Fox. Like, Can we get a wire-to-wire awesome De'Aaron Fox season? Is that too much to ask? And the Athletic just wrote a puff piece about him this morning, and I read it, and like they're, they're saying the right things about Fox. I feel like this is the first time in years they're putting him in a system where he's actually going to thrive. So I think we're going to see a big year from Fox. Can we uh, get the turnover count, though? Yeah. Well, he had, he had eight still, the other night, man. Some are saying eight, eight, but yeah, I, seven or eight yeah, I can't, confirm, <laughs> can't confirm or deny that it was eight. But I was, you know, the rest of the stat line was pretty great. Yeah. Um, I'll leave one more how name. About, uh, yeah, go for it. I hope it's the same name I'm thinking of. Grayson Allen. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, I went past that one. I cannot I have stand one more him. Than Even that. as a Duke fan, I cannot stand Grayson Allen. Man, <laughs> he's going to be top 100 for the next month, right? Chris Middleton's still yeah. out. They're missing Pat, who was obviously yeah. one of their best bench players last year, made some starts as well. Grayson Allen, he can get you three threes. He can get you a steal. Pretty efficient. Um, he's better than he gets credit for because no one likes him. But yeah, if you can stomach handling him on your roster, I think Grayson's going to have a top 100 run for the next month. Yeah, no argument here. The the, the coast is kind of clear for him to kind of step forward. He can get you some defensive numbers. Um, more so than, say, a Jordan War. So that's going to get him good minutes until they get Connaughton and Middleton back in there. 12 points, four assists, two threes in 31 minutes in their opener. I feel like we can't leave today without quickly talking about Bull Bull, who actually is in the Magic rotation. We we know, like, I mean, a, still a wildly intriguing player, right? We don't really know whether he can hold up physically in the NBA. We don't know how many minutes he's going to get, but... 18 minutes, 10 points, six rebounds, and a block. Like in a deeper league, I feel like there are wilder flyers to take at this point. Just throw on your bench and see what happens over the next couple of weeks. For what it's worth, I'm one of Bull Bull's biggest fans. I even have a couple <laughs> of his uh, Ricky cards. I love Bull Bull. I think he's one of the most fun players to watch in the NBA. Uh, I think the big question, obviously, is can he do this over the full course of the season because of all those lower right. body injuries, the foot injuries, uh, the back issues. But man, he's just so much fun. I love him. It looks like he's having fun for the first time in his career. He hated his life in Denver. It looked like you, you saw him on draft night, too. He had that same attitude in Denver. Never got a, a real chance, which is a shame. But the Magic, you know how much they love length, and Bull Bull has all the length in the world. Um, if he sticks around 18 to 24 minutes going forward, you never know. They're playing, what, four power forwards a night? It's crazy. Yeah. So much fun. So, yeah, in a deeper league, you could do worse. Yeah, there was one point in Wednesday's game where they had the lineup of Caleb Houston, Franz Wagner, Bull Bull, um, I believe Mo Bamba was out there, and Wendell Carter Jr. 
Oh man. Now, if that doesn't tell the people that your franchise loves that wingspan, you know, component, yeah. I don't know what does. Um, I think my concern with Bull, not just the medical history, but also there's a bit of a log jam in that front court. They got so many guys. Sure. Like we don't know when some of them are going to play, Jonathan Isaac, you know, but there's so many potential, you know, hurdles for him to clear in terms of playing time. He can get you good numbers in about 18 minutes, but I think that's probably the most that you're going to expect from him playing time wise. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, there's a reason he's at the end of this conversation. I think if, you know, your waiver wire is pretty bare and you, you want something with some semblance of upside, like, mm-hmm. I don't know. We'll see what happens over the next game or two. Um, yeah. By the way, uh, not waiver wire related, but how about that debut from Palo Bancaro? I mean, I, I was, I, we were talking the other day and I was saying, well, I like the player, but I are those numbers that all around across the board, we hadn't seen it in the preseason really. Right. We hadn't seen him sort of pop off statistically. So I was wondering, is it going to translate right away? And then of course the lights go on and man, he just looks like a stud. So Dude, I, I regret Joseph, not getting man. him in more leagues. What's poor that? Corey Joseph, he just got slammed <laughs> on so hard, dude. That yeah. was a sick dunk. Yeah. yeah. But impressive start for him. And I think, what was it, five assists, two blocks? I mean, that was kind of the yeah. stuff that we were wondering, will will he start putting that in the box score? And did it right away. So he's going to be awesome. This is going to yep. be a, f- a fun rookie class, I think, for sure. to watch. All right. Guys, that's going to do it for us on this episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, wherever you listen. Take a minute to rate and review us as well. We will be back on Monday. I believe Raph, you'll be here with me to round up more waiver wire pickups from the weekend and the big headlines coming out of the weekend fantasy-wise. So check us out on Monday live at noon. And in the meantime, check out the full waiver wire column on NBC Sports Edge from Jonas. Raph, you got anything you want to mention before we go? Um, No, I, I think... You can about covered it all. Yeah. Okay, sweet. <laughs> I want to say thanks to everyone for listening and watching live. If you want Kawhi Leonard in the company league, hit me up. You know where to find me. <laughs> Raph, Jonas, thanks, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you both. All right. Take care. Thanks.